All right, welcome to the September 23rd and on Creds Working Group meeting. Um, going to hear from Mark and Harold about um, Oracle Labs progress report on their work, um, status updates on various projects, and talk briefly about a consideration of a move of an on creds to the Decentralized Identity Foundation, which is something we have started to consider. Um, this is a Linux Foundation LF decentralized trust meeting. No longer necessarily a Hyperledger meeting because that entity is kind of transformed into LF uh, decentralized trust. So um, the Linux Foundation antitrust policy is still is in effect, as is the code of conduct from LFDT. Both are listed. All right. Um, I guess we all know each other. Anyone have any announcements or anything else to share that we want to add to the agenda? Well, all right then. Uh, Mark, do you just want to take it away? Sure. Um, yeah, as I said in email uh steve um and not i don't have a fresh set of slides approved so i've just got my slides yeah. that i gave at iaw and i can't remember if i presented from those slides in this meeting before no you haven't oh okay all right well i've got them here and they are publicly available Good. um but i think we could just uh, i don't think it makes sense for me to go you know give the iaw talk or something um because a lot of preaching to the choir and stuff but yeah. i'll put them up for context so we can flick through a couple of things okay. just to refresh um and then i'll just give kind of a verbal update on what we've been up to and what we're doing okay so um harold is um out on vacation by the way so he's okay. not uh, yeah. with us and let me find my PowerPoint, there it is. Okay. So this is, yeah, like I say, the talk that I gave at IAW in April. So it's, um, you know, somewhat out of date, but it at least gives some context. And I'm just gonna, uh, let's see, let me put it like that. Does it look okay? Yep, looks great. All right, cool. So let me just um, race through and yeah, definitely feel free to slow me down or, or whatever, but I'll just race through a few things that I think will help be helpful to establish context. That's good. Um, so we've got this um, kind of uh, elevator pitch, which is basically saying, you know, we need better privacy, but if we get too much privacy, we lose accountability and that sort of undermines the ability to have privacy. And so we think um, verifiable credentials and, and zero knowledge proofs can help to strike an effective balance. But from what we've learned, a lot of the projects and standards um, are, either don't support these features. And I just finished watching the video of the last meeting. And so you were focusing on the few that do uh, support some of these features. Um, and then those that do are often, um, you know, quite closely tied together between the credential formats and the um, underlying cryptography libraries such that it is um, challenging to easily switch between multiple ones. Um, for example, if you have a, a new library that you'd like to switch to, then how do, how do you actually use it likely changes and so you've got to do a bunch of work. So that's the kind of problem that we're exploring uh, with what we're doing. Um, what we're doing is learning and, and demonstrating these things uh, internally in the company, and we're developing this abstraction to decouple those two pieces, the, verif the credential formats and the underlying cryptography libraries. Um, so far, as of IAW time, we had defined an initial abstraction. We'd made a Docker container so that people uh, internally can uh, experiment with it. Um, and we had in, implemented that abstraction over the doc network crypto library um, and developed a, um, a use case demo, which I'll show a little slide of that in a moment, just for context to, to sort of indicate the features that we're, I was going to say interested in, but there are, of course, other interesting features, but uh, there's only so much a small team like ours can do in any given amount of time. Um, 
So, yeah, since then we have, um, uh, you know, become engaged with the non-creds too and also started to uh, uh, use the uh, cryptography. We call it AC2C internally. In our minds, that is distinguishing between a non-creds, the credential format, and a non-creds, the cryptography library. So we just leave that C on the end whenever we're talking about the cryptography. Um, okay, so that's our general approach. Um, all right, so I won't, th this is all preaching to the choir here, so um, I'll just skip it, basically saying, hey, we can combine zero knowledge proofs these days yep. uh, in privacy preserving ways. I won't walk through this use case step by step because people get it. Um, but basically, the idea is that we've got a, a, a holder who can provide proofs about credentials satisfying various properties specified either by the verifier or in collaboration with the verifier, whatever that's in a sense above our pay grade. What does the verifier want to be proved and what does the holder have to prove we sort of take as uh, passed down from someone else. Um, usual stuff, They can the verifier can verify that the properties um, about the credentials presented are true. Um, and then they can also go and present something. So uh, according to this use case, the verifier can know that the uh, holder has a valid driver's license, hasn't been revoked, they're over a certain age, it's, um, can, they, they can drive this kind of car, uh, and they've pay, paid their monthly subscription, and neither of those have been revoked. And they have also included encrypted for some authority, so we use police in our example, um, some identifying information, so that they can be held accountable if they do something wrong. But up until the time that they do something wrong, the verifier, the, the car company doesn't know who they are, can't correlate and say, oh, this is the same person who rented yesterday. Um, but in case they, you know, crash the car or steal the car or whatever, um, the verifier can go to the authority, present them with something which they've been able to verify is correctly encrypted for the authority, but they can't decrypt with that. And then the authority can decrypt it and they can also go and prove to what we call a governance body for general purposes, but you can imagine it's a court, they're going to get a, an arrest warrant. They can provide proof to the governance body that they really are asking for the warrant for the person who rented the car. So that sort of covers um, the various features. So selective disclosure, um, equality proofs to say to show that it's the same person um, who has paid the subscription as has the driver's license. Range proofs for date of birth, for example, um, verifiable encryption uh, for the accountability, and I uh, can't remember if I missed something, but that's the general range of things. Yep. Student anonymous identifiers? Um, from our uh, perspective, so we haven't done anything with blinding at this point. Okay. Um, so for for what we do today, the issuer does know the identifier, for example, the revocation element or, or handle or whatever we want to call it, the issuer knows it. Um, we acknowledge that the various crypto libraries can handle blinding um, various attributes, and we just have not got to that yet. It's not, um, I don't okay. know, just time, right? Yep. Um, yep. Okay. So that's kind of that. All right. I'm going to start racing ahead. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, we've talked a lot about the motivation for, for the abstraction in terms of, um, you know, being able to, for me, a, a big part of it is uh, the different pieces, like different credential formats and different cryptography libraries, being able to evolve much more independently of each other. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, a new credential format can come along and take advantage of all the existing crypto libraries or an existing credential format can um, be um, applied to use a different crypto library or a later version of this, the crypto library or whatever. Um, so this reduces risk for um, for making decisions about which, which projects to use, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, another motivation which was not in these slides but which has become really clear um, and valuable to us is that we can define tests that are independent of which library is going to use them so once we've got a test for example can i you know disclose one attribute and get the right value and prove that another one uh, is it within a certain range 
I can take that test and apply it against each cryptography library that implements our abstraction. Um, so that's actually, I think, uh, really um, useful for the for the community to have the ability to take tests, including you know happy path tests and and what does the library do if we do this wrong thing? Uh, all of those things we can kind of automatically run across all of the underlying cryptography libraries. Yep. Um, so that's um, yeah. I don't know. This is sort of pre preaching to the choir, I think. Um, probably just roughly said a lot of this. Oh, and another one is is ensuring that people who are developing applications to use these technologies don't have to become experts in how to invoke the underlying cryptography libraries and don't need to go and learn a different one. Um, once a different one implements the abstraction, people above that abstraction can continue to use it without... Um, really without being aware of exactly what uh, the underlying um, library is and how, how its calls are different and so on. Um, okay, so here's kind of a picture, uh, picture pictorial uh, representation of the same thing. So um, below the abstraction, different cryptography libraries can implement it. And so far, we've dealt only with um, um, what we call AC2C. So again, the cryptographic pieces of non-creds2. Um, and uh, doc network crypto um, underneath. And then on top, different credential formats can target the abstraction and different presentation request formats can target the abstraction. Um, so you can sort of capture what it is about a use, use case without really committing to uh, either the credential and presentation request formats as presented to, to users or other parts of applications or whatever. Uh, and neither to the to the particular cryptographic library being used. Um, um, Mark, quick yeah. question: How much do you have to know about the um, the schema data attributes to be able to use the different cryptography? So, for right. example, do you have to know that a certain value is going to be a number? And and how and, and where do you capture that? Right. Uh, yes. So we have uh, a notion of a schema, um, which is not identical to what others use, but we decided we'll use that because it's close enough that it may, occupies the same sort of part of your brain. Uh, for each attribute, you know, so when you're creating an issuer, mm -hmm. you specify a schema, and that for us is simply a list of attributes and their claim types, and that's again language that we adopted to, to correspond to what others in, in particular and non creds are using. Uh, we have more claim types than the non creds have, and I'll explain why. We have text and integer, mm -hmm. uh, which um, uh, actually I shouldn't say we have more, we have a different set. Mm -hmm. So we have text and integer. Yeah. We also have accumulator um, member, and the reason for that is not so much that it needs to have a different structure in it, it just needs to really be some some data. We actually restrict it to text. And I noticed um, that um, a non-creds2 allows that to be a number. Um, no technical reason why we couldn't do that too, but we just haven't so far. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason that we specifically identify them as accumulators is that we have higher level utilities that do things like, um, oh, go and create all the accumulators for the schema. Um, so to be able to do that, you need to know which, thing, which things are going to be actually treated as accumulators. Uh, and then the last one I want to mention is that we have a special claim type for encryptable text. Um, and the reason for that is that um, we encode the to be encrypted value in a certain way following uh, essentially what doc network crypto have done uh, so that the encoding is reversible uh, that way um, th that's necessary to be able to um, uh, identify you know in our use case example the thing that's encrypted is the social security number of, of the driver um, if that is just hashed to something um, and then you decrypt it and get the decrypted hashed 
thing that doesn't give you back the 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 value unless you knew what you started with uh, so that's why we um, identify it as as encryptable uh, hopefully that answered the question yep thanks um Sure, I'll do a bit more racing ahead so you get the idea. Some libraries are below, some credential formats above. Um, this is all just motivation for, you might wanna substitute different libraries, including ones that don't exist yet. Um, and in fact, there are two levels of this interface. So there's the crypto interface, which kind of defines the minimal requirements for a particular, let's say, new library to implement in order to support uh, the features that the platform provides. Um, we've had various um, internal debate about how narrow this gap should be, and lately we're, we're narrowing it. Um, and it's basically that, um, for example, um, the, the work, you know, the what we call our, our platform code, does things like take a, um, um, a presentation request and does all kinds of processing on it that, that can be done in general without knowing what the particular underlying library is. So for example, it can say, we're gonna need a range proof, we're gonna need a this proof and then that proof, and it gives it uh, in a sort of standard format that a new crypto library can come and implement just that. So a bunch of the work has been done for it. Uh, say error checking can be done for it already. Um, and so um, that is why this kind of a, a separate interface that the crypto library implements, that the cryptographer library person understands concepts at this level that people using it don't need to understand. So that gives us an opportunity to to do a bunch of work that can be done in, in common for all of the credential formats. Okay. Um, I think for today, I want to stay away from, I'll just mention this as, as a reminder, I think we talked about it before. The key to how we abstract the different data types is we have this notion of opaque material. So a particular cryptography library, let's say AC2C, um, decides, well, for a public, uh, you know, for, for the public and secret data for a, a, for a signer, I want this information. And a different library, say Doc Network, might say, I want this other information. So each of them defines how they map between their um, internal formats and the opaque material required for that role. And that way, um, people above that abstraction, they don't need to know or think about those different formats. They just say, I've got some signer data. The signer data is separable at, a, at above the abstraction level into public data and secret data, of course, because they need to be able to take the public data and make it public and take the secret data and keep it secret. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so example stuff let's not get into um i missed a question a, a bit back mark can i ask you one more at this point yeah. and it comes back to in the um credential formats you had uh you listed w3c and acdc have just a matter of interest have you done any looking into what acdc is or and would it yeah. lend itself to this I think so. Um, we oh. did have some discussions with Sam Smith and others at um, at IIW. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, um, the 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 sort of a underlying design principle for a non creds two, which is they're not going to use any fancy crypto. They want to get started, so they say we've got cryptographic hashes, we've got um, uh, traditional digital signatures, and that's all. Yeah. Um, so that um, is clearly a good pragmatic choice that lets them make lots of progress, but it also, um, well, it constrains them, right? Yeah. So yeah. One, one of the things is either you've got to present the same credential uh, every time and, okay, maybe it's hashed, but it's correlatable, uh, yeah. or their answer to that is bulk issuance. Um, so we estimate how many times this credential is likely to be used, and we we enable um, 
uh, issuing that many of those credentials, and then the the holders got to manage which ones that they present yeah. in order to maintain non correlatability. They need to go back and get more if the issuer is still willing and available to sign more if they run out and that kind of thing. So um, by abstract abstracting away these things, um, the potential exists for something like um, uh, ACDC in future to say, okay, we'd like to have selective disclosure, we'd like to do range proofs, we'd like to have uncorrelatable uh, presentations without um, uh, bulk issuance and so on. Um, and yeah, we, we discussed this with Sam Smith and also with uh, Kent Bull, if I'm remembering the right people that I discussed with. And, yep. and they seemed, um, you know, obviously they have their, their design principles for now and, and um, uh, not changing any anytime soon, but they seemed quite um, open to and, and enthusiastic about the idea that there would be uh, convenient ways of, of using these features that wouldn't require tons of work on, on their part. So, cool, thanks. All right. I uh, don't know why I left this slide up while I talked about that. I interrupted. Uh, please. <laughs> I said that's why you left that slide up. I interrupted you. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought someone said, can I interrupt? <laughs> nope. And I avoided saying apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are the claim types that we talked about before. Um, that's oh, the, oh, that's that is a schema. Um, so text, naturals, accumulated memory. Yeah, I said them all. Okay. Um, there are some that we don't have that a non-creds has. Um, you guys are probably thinking of them, but I'm not. Anyway, um, is accumulator member and and set membership? Do you think that's the same? That is the same. Yeah. Um, and in our in our view, the fact that uh, accumulator, uh, it, you know, that set membership is being used for revocation is something that lives above the abstraction. So unlike AC2C, we don't have two separate claim types and we don't um, uh, we don't impose a requirement that the there there is an accumulator, that it's in a certain position or anything like that. Um, that's above the abstraction. And if, if a particular credential format wants to have that opinion and, and enforce it, they do that above the abstraction. Because okay. uh, you can actually do a set membership without accumulators too. Yeah. Um, it's a little more complicated though. Yeah. There's, there's obviously uh, lots of directions in which you could go more and more general um, and and get more and more bogged down and not make progress. So we've sort of, you know, we, we've done what we have done. Um, one thing that is interesting is, and I'll, I'll come back to this in more detail, but we've got um, accumulators and updates and, and all of that working with the, the VB accumulators, both with Doc Network Crypto and with um, AC2C. Um, however, so that's, you know, that sort of is nice in the sense that our abstraction um, held up Love with to it. going to a second library. Um, but that abstraction, I have not, you know, I've read about Alisor and thought about it some, but I don't expect that our abstraction will will accommodate Alisor because there's more parties involved with Alisor. There's more things to say, right? So, um, yeah. the For the um, proofs? Not for the proofs. Those no, are I'm exactly saying, the same. Yeah, no, I'm saying there's more parties, like there's multiple revocation manager, um, uh, I don't know what you call them, roles being played, right? Potentially there are, and there's different data that you're going to split up data and send to different parties and stuff like that. So the abstraction that mm -hmm. we have just for these accumulators doesn't accommodate that. I haven't given a whole lot of thought about whether it can be kind of, you know, wedged in there or the abstraction needs to change. That's something we'd think about in future. Fair enough. All right, let's keep going. Um, so this is just a um, proof requests in our sort of standardized format. So it basically says for a credential that I'm going to call driver's license, you need to give me um, proof that you've got a signature signed by the issuer that shall be known as DL issuer and it's public 
parameters are in a different file called, or in a different structure called shared params. The idea there being at least twofold. One is it makes this easier to read than putting a, <coughs> a, a great big chunk of uh, text and, and numbers in, in place of the public key for the issuer. And then the other is that it, it separates the use case from the parameters. So you could take the same use case and, and use it with different parameters by changing what's in the shared parameter file. Um, so this shows, yeah, something should be an accumulator. We haven't done anything with not an accumulator and uh, with, you know, um, uh, we've only done positive uh, accumulator support so far. Not sure if we'd get around to, to negative. Uh, in range, you know, range proofs. Um, encrypted for, same thing. The the authority that shall be known as the common authority PK. We just called it common because we used it for both credentials, uh, the driver's license and subscription, but it, of course it could be different ones. Um, and then this equal to is saying that attribute five of the driver's license, which I'm sure you memorized the earlier slide, that is the social security number in the driver's license, is equal to attribute two in the subscription credential, and that's the social security number in the subscription credential. So that says that it's the same person who's licensed to drive who has paid their subscription. Um, and here's the other Here's the th same thing for the subscription cred, and so uh, you can see um, nothing new interesting here, I don't think. All right, um, decryption requests. So when one comes to verify a proof, so the verifier just verifies it, um, and hopefully it says true and it's all good. Um, if the verifier goes to the authority let's say to the police and says uh, hey this guy crashed our car please find out who it is um, the police can decrypt it and the way that they do that is they verify the proof themselves but they also include some decryption requests saying i want to decrypt this uh attribute of this credential and here's my secret key and the decryption key that go with it and again those are opaque things that um don't have any meaning above the abstraction line, except that they give back the same secret key that you got. That's the way to get uh, the decryption to work. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So instead of going into what four, five month old challenges and discussion, instead I'll uh, switch now to telling a little bit of what we've been up to. Yeah. Good. Uh, and our progress. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so. We um, have done our prototyping work in Haskell, a uh, much more productive um, way for us to, to prototype. Um, and we have been, oh, so let me say what we've done in the Haskell prototype first of all, and then talk about Rust. So we have targeted now both um, Doc Network Crypto and AC2C to our abstraction. Um, and we have a, developed a test framework, which essentially manages all the state in the world. So it's got everyone's keys and credentials and requests and all of that stuff, and basically can be driven by a little, um, I suppose I would call it a, a DSL for a use case. So it can say things like set up a credential, uh, set up an issuer with the schema, uh, create its um, accumulators, sign a credential with this data, um, require the holder to disclose its date of birth. You, you, you know, there's just these kind of commands to do. And then the test framework will go and run all of those things uh, against the whichever crypto uh, cryptographic library it is um, with which it is instantiated. Um, and... Some of those tests we have written in Haskell. Others we have exported to JSON. Um, and then we have the ability to suck in the JSON expression of the particular test and, um, and run it. And the, that JSON can not only um, express what the test should do, but also its requirements. Uh, it's sorry, its expectations. So for example, if I have got a, um, a credential signed and I've got a witness for an accumulator, but someone else has had a credential signed or one revoked. And so my witness is now out of date. If I try to create a proof, 
um, complying with the request that I not um, not revoked as of the latest accumulator, it should fail. Uh, so that's a, a negative test in the sense that we expect that it fail and it better fail, right? Because otherwise revocation is not working. Um, so that kind of thing. Um, in addition to that, we also have um, a Swagger API, which we um, extracted um, almost entirely automatically. There are a few little um, bits that had to be um, fixed manually uh, to get it to um, to enable uh, uh, yeah an open API interface to this abstraction. And that's where the real abstraction is. We we often think of it as being expressed in data types of programming languages, but of course. Uh, that's slightly lower level. Um, so yeah, we have a Swagger API for it. We have a server that serves that API, and we have a few toy um, uh, client applications in various languages, um, just to sort of keep ourselves honest and make sure we really are able to um, deal with the different data formats from multiple languages and so on. Okay, so that's that's kind of all on the internal uh, side. We want to share this uh, approach with the world. We've found that just um, expressing our opinions, um, I'm sure everyone uh, has the same experience, just expressing your opinions doesn't quite convince people. So we eventually got around to saying, well, let's just do it. Let's show the world what we're thinking and what the benefits of it we think there are. Mm -hmm. And of course, to do that, we need to um, make it public. And the, the venue or vehicle we've uh, chosen to do that is via um, uh, contribution to the AC2C project. So even though it's it's more general than than AC2C, um, right. we think that that's a great um, place for it because that's um, uh, that's where a lot of people are going. For example, after the um, uh, the demise of um, Hyperledger Ursa. Um, and because um, the project is at a good stage for um, contributing, contributing, it's not already sort of baked in and being used by um, millions of people and that kind of thing. So, um, so we would like to do equivalent stuff in Rust. We had an intern. He has finished a few months ago. Uh, sorry, a few weeks ago. Uh, we had him for a few months. Um, and he um, made a great start on translating our Haskell prototype into Rust, which was also super useful for us because we were, um, me more than Harold, Harold had also already done some Rust, um, for example, to uh, uh, FFI work to make sure that we could call um, these underlying libraries from Haskell. Um, I was more or less a beginner uh, in Rust. Uh, so it's been really helpful having a, having a teacher who's working on our stuff. <laughs> so um, we're not doing hello world, we're doing uh, conceptually uh, complicated <laughs> things um, that we already understand in one language. So that's been a, a great way for us to learn. Um, and so now that the um, um, internship has finished, um, productivity has slowed, but not to zero. So <laughs> it seems that uh, um, that we uh, succeeded in coming up to speed enough to be able to do some stuff. Um, so where we're up to, um, we have got almost all of that functionality now working in Rust, including the test framework. Um, and the nice thing about the being able to express those tests in JSON is that we we write the tests in Haskell code then we export them to JSON, and then we copy them over to the other repo and, and, and load them and run them. So we don't have to write Rust code to express our tests. And furthermore, um, anyone can, uh, can come up with their own tests in JSON however they prefer to do that. They could write it in their language of choice and export it, or heaven forbid, they could just um, write it in a text editor, um, but express their proof requirements um, or use case requirements and have the test run it against whichever underlying library that they specify. So, so far in Rust, we have only targeted um, a non-creds too. Um, it's future work to do um, doc network crypto as well. 
um, but we wanted to get um, the the library of the repo in which we're contributing this stuff as the obvious first choice. Um, and we've got all of that functionality working, except we haven't quite done verifiable encryption. Um, I'm working on that now, although I've been commanded by myself to stop working on it because I've got been putting off various um, fun stuff like reporting to management and things like that. So I'm not allowed to do any more technical work till I've got my uh, updates to management done and stuff like well, that. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I I was about to submit a PR Friday, but then I've been pulling the firefighting all day. So right. <laughs> so yeah. I feel like it's the way it goes. But uh, but anyway, um, and yeah, we're, I was happy to hear you say, Mike, earlier that um, you're working on the verifiable or the decryption part of the verifiable encryption yeah. um, because we don't have that working in, on the Haskell side with an on-creds too uh, because uh, because it doesn't exist yet. Um, but when it does, we I want to be at a point, uh, well, let me put it this way. I want to make it your problem. <laughs> so far, it's <laughs> my problem that, um, that we don't actually support uh, uh, um, verifiable, be, verifiable decryption in the test framework. Um, so it says we don't currently support that. What I'd like it to say is a non-creds doesn't currently support that. And then soon thereafter, I'd like it to say, yes, we did it. Um, so hopefully our timing is pretty um, pretty compatible on that. But it doesn't really matter, you know, who gets there first. Um, okay, so, all right. Uh, that is kind of my um, update. I will say that we are tasking ourselves to make this not with we don't intend to make a pull request against non creds too because there's a lot of stuff here we need to get feedback we need to we need to endure the oh my god you guys can't write rust to save yourselves you really should have done it this way and and honestly we are already doing that to ourselves as we learn more like oh okay we shouldn't have done that way there's there's definitely still markers of of haskell uh coding style that you know sometimes it's a good thing sometimes actually we really shouldn't have done it that way and so we want to get feedback um our goal is to um make uh make it public in our public fork of uh, okay. an on uh, b2rs whatever it's called yeah for discussion and feedback and and um alignment with with everyone's goals and the hope would be that we'll work towards a pull request that can be accepted in, into the to, into the official repo. But that's not we're not going to create a pull request off the bat because we want to get feedback and continue to improve it and so on. Yeah. Um, and we are aiming to do that. Our goal is to do it two weeks before IAW. Okay. Uh, and then uh, so that will enable people to have a look and then uh, you know facilitate some discussions and hopefully presentation at IAW. I have submitted my travel request to come to IAW. I have not heard back about it yet, so we don't know for sure. But independent of that, we definitely want to uh, um, try and get something out the door. And I'm kind of shy. Harold is less so. So I'm like, oh, we've got to clean all this up before we make it public. He's like, no, we don't. So. <laughs> But um, yes, we will we will find that balance and we will uh, make something public um, all going well uh, within a month or so. And that's it from me. Any other questions I'm happy to take? Any questions from anyone? All right. Thanks, Mark. That was awesome. Uh, much appreciated. Um, very helpful. Um, Victor, do you want to do a summary or catch up on where you are with the Alisor revocation manager work you've been doing, which is pretty cool? Yeah, really. Uh, there is not much change since last time. Uh, do you mind if I share my screen? Sure, go for it. So, like, currently, I think the first part is done in terms of having this API running. Yeah. Um, currently, there is only single server, and now, like compared right. to last time, we now support uh, batch delete, which is working now, and also uh, user update, 
which is some PC update. But currently this function is not working because we only have a single server in this case. And now I've been looking into setting up uh, multiple servers using Docker. And uh, yeah, I'm also looking at uh, Mike's uh, this general in terms of like MPC for, for key distribution. Yeah, that, that is pretty much I have. Uh, yeah, that is pretty much I have. Okay. All right. That will be super helpful when we um, get around to considering how Alisor might be accommodated by our abstraction too. Uh, I think Victor's done a lot of the uh, work for yeah. that already. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, the last topic we had that I wanted to mention. Uh, oh, Mike, any updates from you? You've got the MPC part of Alisor done, right? So that Victor can take that. Uh, yeah, the Beaver triple part and the DKG. So the Gennaro is the DKG. Mm -hmm. and when he's ready, I'll, um, well, I'll just submit the, the Beaver triple part this week and then I'll tidy up verifiable encryption. I'd, I've been involved in firefighting at work all day. <laughs> so yeah, I haven't had much time to do it, but it's by tomorrow and Wednesday to be all read up. Okay. Um, and no further updates on Agora contributions or updates in the last couple of weeks. I don't think so, but. Oh, well, actually I've made a lot of progress on the verifiable secret sharing part. Okay. We'll also update the, um, the Gennaro stuff. So I have made good progress and just about done with the verifiable secret sharing one. And then I can contribute that. Then I'll just apply the updates to Gennaro and then I'll contribute that. So I'm just about done with the verifiable secret sharing. That one has taken me a while to update and fix and test. Yeah. But I'm just about done. Excellent. Probably by the end of this week, I'll be done with both. Okay, well, stop firefighting. Switch or solve the, you know, put out the fire. Um, if I could, I would. I can't, so I won't. <laughs> um, so Mike and I had a conversation with Kim Hamilton Duffy about possibly moving in on creds from Hyperledger and LFDT into DIFF where there's more going on related to ZKPs and um, BBS work and so on. So a heads up to the community that that's a possibility. Mark, I don't know how that would mess up your life. Um, although the repository links would remain the same, um, but you'd be redirected to decentralized identity, but it's the same repo. Um, so I don't know how that would screw things up. I think it should be fine as long as the licensing terms aren't changing or anything like that. Nope, nothing like that would change. Okay. Um, likely, um, through the conversations we've had, Agora would stay where it is, um, at least for now, but, um, yeah. So we'll be talking more with Kim on that. If anyone wants to contribute to that, um, let us know. And I think that's the set of topics I have for now. So I think that's it. Any other comments from anyone? Um, yeah, like for a while there, we were trying to decide what the non creds two data models would be. Are we still working on that or are we? I mean, the there hasn't been work done, but the goal is to have them as W. My goal would be to have them as W3 CVCs. And I think that's generally what we've thought is we do the same sort of thing we did with an on creds one. Um, we didn't nail down exactly and um, how that would be done, but I think it's pretty straightforward. I know Victor did a bunch of work on that leading up to it or, or you know, enabling us to take a look and have the discussion. I just, I've had no time to, to sort of focus on that, but that would be the goal. Okay. All right. Thanks all.
Thanks, Mark, in particular. Thank and you. Um, look forward, Victor, to uh, the cool stuff you're going to be doing next. All right, folks, take care. See ya. Thanks, everyone. All right. See ya. Bye.